Hello, everyone. My name is Ariella Wagner. I'm the founder of Sunray Construction Solutions. We help thousands of general contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers secure their lien and bond claim rights. Sunray secures over $10 billion annually. Today, we have an incredible webinar that I'm hoping will help many, many viewers. Owed 8,000 or less, here's how to take them to court yourself. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the fabulous construction attorney, Alex Barthet. Thanks, Ariella. Again, my name is Alex Barthet. I am a board certified construction attorney here in the state of Florida. And today we're going to talk about how to take someone to court yourself if you're owed $8,000 or less. So let's go ahead and get started. So what's on the agenda for today? So let's talk about a few things you can do before you have to hire a lawyer. So maybe you never even have to consider hiring a lawyer. We'll talk about what a lawyer uh, can do for you that you can't do, meaning why do you need to even hire a lawyer? Uh, we'll talk about how to recover legal fees. That's always a big issue. Um, one of the drivers in determining whether or not it's worth hiring a lawyer is how do you recover your legal fees? We'll talk about that. And then we'll go through the steps on how to file a small claims case yourself. And I will point you to some additional resources that will go into much greater detail so you can file a claim on your own. Um, and as always, we will answer any questions that you have at the end. So you can use the GoToWebinar chat box that is on your screen to submit your questions. We will answer all the questions at the end. Please do not include the names of any people or companies in your questions. All right, let's get right into it. So the best way um, to solve a problem is to avoid it completely. So if you can avoid having to even consider hiring a lawyer, that is the best way to not have to take anyone to court yourself or hire a lawyer. So what are some of the things you can do to solve that problem? So number one, ideally you have a contract in writing and it has terms and conditions that cover the most important issues that you deal with in your business. I would let me list a few of them for you. So one, you should have a, an agreement that is your form of agreement and it addresses payment terms. When are you going to get paid? How are you going to get paid? Um, what happens if you don't get paid? Um, so do you have the right to stop work? Some people assume automatically that you have this, the right to stop work. Um, more likely than not, if you are signing someone else's contract, it probably precludes you from having the right to stop work um, if you are not getting paid. So you want to make sure to add that to your contract or the contract that someone may give you. And then what I would suggest is talk to people in your, in your business or, or consider the problems or disputes or confrontations you've had in the past and make a list of exceptions. That list of exceptions should be your in your terms and conditions, right? So maybe you're a fire sprinkler contractor and you don't paint the pipe when you install it. So put that in as an exclusion, right? The, that this quote excludes all painting of uh, pipes and fixtures. Whatever it may be, um, you should put that list together and it should be a, an evolving list over time. We had a client, um, it's been in business for almost 50 years. And when he hired us, he handed me his contract and it was rather disjointed, but it had um, lots of terms and conditions. And he said, every one of those exclusions, I have a story about. There's someone that screwed me out of a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars. Um, so when that happened, I added a provision to my contract to make sure it wouldn't happen again. Um, that's the kinds of things you should be doing. You should use Sunray to send your notice to owners. The people that get paid the fastest and the most of their claim are the ones that timely protect their lien and bond rights. And in Florida, the first step in that process is serving a notice to owner. And the great folks at Sunray will help you do that very easily. So here's a pro tip, send a notice to owner even if you don't need to. So for example, you may be a small uh, residential construction contractor. You have a contract almost exclusively uh, every time with an owner. 
you don't need to send a notice to owner in that situation. But if you do send the notice to owner, I think you will see an increase in your collections because the owner, that homeowner, gets this document in the mail that looks very official. They get it via certified mail. They take you a little more seriously. Um, so our advice is in your office, you should set up a process that any job over a certain amount of money, $500, $1,000, $2,500, whatever you determine, you should notice every one of those jobs, no questions asked. Next, this sounds much easier uh, in principle than it is in practice, but stop doing work for someone that owes you money. Um, you know, we have clients that come to us and they say, you know, I'm owed $25,000, $50,000, $100,000. Um, you know, at some point they were only owed five or 10 or 20, uh, but they let that credit keep going. So keep an eye on how much money is being uh, accumulated in the form of credit by the people that you are doing work for. And to the extent your contract permits you to stop work so that that debt doesn't increase until you get a better sense that you're going to get paid. Um, as I said before, those that have lien and bond rights are typically the first to get paid and they get paid the fastest. So you need to make sure that you use Sunray and record your lien and bond claims to get paid. And then uh, the squeak, squeaky wheel gets the grease. So call, email, visit the debtor often to try to get paid. Do everything you, do, you can do to get paid before you have to file a lawsuit. So our most successful clients at collections the, the clients that send us the fewest cases are the ones that have the most robust and aggressive in-house collection processes. So that's who you want to be. So why do you even need to hire a lawyer? Um, so one is just like you need to go see a doctor, right? Uh, lawyers are professionals. Uh, they have a lot of experience in the law. And if they're construction lawyers, they have a lot of experience in construction issues and they can give you good advice on the merits of your case and the likelihood of success. You may think you've been wrong, but when you talk to a lawyer, they may point out certain situations or facts um, or circumstances in your, in your case that are problems for you. Um, so I'll give you an example. We had a um, not a client, actually, he, someone that called uh, two weeks ago, and he said, you know, I'm owed $18,000, I did all this work, um, and the owner doesn't want to pay me. And I said, well, do you have a license? Well, no, I don't have a license, but I did all this work, and I delivered the materials, and I installed it, and they don't want to pay me. And unfortunately, I had to tell them that um, the scope of work he did required a state license, and he didn't have a license. And there's a statute that says that if you need a license and don't have a license, then you're not entitled to be paid. So um, that's an example, an extreme example of a situation in which um, getting advice from a lawyer can avoid uh, spending time and money on a case that may not be worth anything. What else does a lawyer do? Um, they send letters on their letterhead. So you know, one of the steps of collections is letting the other side know that that they are um, that you may sue them and one of the ways you indicate that you may sue them is they get a letter from a lawyer um, that's the first indication that you've uh, decided to pursue this matter further so now they need to be more careful do you want to go forward with not paying me because look i've sent you a letter from my lawyer um, and then Generally speaking, the reason you need a lawyer is because as a business, you are required to be represented by legal counsel. Um, if you are an individual, you do not need a lawyer. You can represent yourself in court. So for example, if I'm Joe the painter, I don't have a company, and I just go around and I paint people's houses. If I'm owed $50,000, 
and I can sue someone because I, and individually, Joe, the painter, I, I'm the one that's owed the money. But if you have a business, a corporation, an LLC, a partnership, those businesses, the, the rules require that they be represented by lawyers with one exception. And that's what we're going to talk about next. And that exception is if you have a claim for a principal value of less than $8,000, then you can sue someone on your own in small claims court. So before we talk about the process of suing someone in small claims court, let's talk about how to recover your legal fees because you may decide, you know what, I don't want to spend the time and effort uh, to do this if I can recover my legal fees. Well, in the state of Florida, there's only two ways to recover your legal fees. Number one is you have a law that you are suing the other side on or violating, and that law says the winner gets their legal fees. So the most common uh, law that we use, um, the two most common laws that we use uh, are the lien statute, which is chapter 713, and the bond statute, chapter 627. And both of those statutes say that the prevailing party in a lawsuit to foreclose on a lien, 713, or to sue on a payment bond, uh, chapter 627, is entitled to recover their legal fees. Now that means you have to go all the way to the end of the case, the judge has to rule that you are the prevailing party, that's when you get your fees. So you may spend money in the, in the meantime, but if you prevail, you may get the other side to pay your legal fees. The other way in the state of Florida that you can recover your legal fees is if you have a written contract, and that contract is signed by the parties, and it says that the prevailing party is entitled to recover his or her legal fees. So those are the two ways. You have a statute that says the winner gets their fees, or you have a written contract that says that the um, winner gets their legal fees. All that being said, most cases settle. At any given time in my office, we have about 500 cases, active cases at any given time. Um, the vast majority settle. 98% settle within the first six months. Um, so you never get to the point where the judge has to make a ruling on who the prevailing party is. Um, but sometimes we are able to settle the case and have the other side pay some or all of our legal fees. But one of the things that I would like to tell you, which I tell many clients is, you should change the perspective on why you need to spend money on legal fees and what the legal process is about. So let's take an example. You're owed, in my example, $50,000 and the other side refuses to pay you, would you accept $40,000 instead of $50,000? Um, most people would say, well, if, if I can't get the 50, I'd rather take 40 than nothing. So the way to look at hiring a lawyer sometimes is when you go to them, uh, that you don't have the right, you don't have the ability to get paid. You may have to spend money to get paid. So are you willing to spend $10,000 in legal fees that you may never get back to recover the 50,000, so you'd net 40,000. Most people say yes. Um, the wrong way to look at the legal system and lawyers is to say, well, if I spend a dollar with a lawyer, I wanna make sure absolutely positively I get that, that dollar. That's very challenging to do in the legal system that we have, again, because most cases settle. Um, so let's get right into it. So what is, what is the process to file a claim in small claims court. So the first thing you have to do is you have to have a claim that is in principle, so excluding interest, is less than $8,000. Now, you may be owed $15,000 and you can sue someone in small claims court on your own, but the court can never award you more than $8,000. So if I owe you $15,000 and you sue me in small claims court and you win, the court is going to award you $8,000 and the rest of that amount of money is going to go away. You're never going to be able to recover it again because it would have been um, resolved in this court case where you got $8,000. Now, maybe you could argue that I have two invoices. Each of them were $7,500. So maybe you filed two cases, a case on invoice one and a case on invoice two. That's possible. Um, so just keep that in mind, that that's the jurisdictional limit. There's some discussion that that, that limit may increase as much as $15,000 in 2023. Um, so keep an eye on that. So how do you file the case? 
So there is a form, and I'm going to tell you how to get it in a minute, where you will uh, fill that this form out. It's very simple. It's like filling out um, any other form that you've ever done. It's you're going to fill out your name, the other side's name, uh, your position, you know, why are you owed, what you're owed, you'll list how much you're owed, and then you're going to pay the filing fee. Again, I'm going to tell you where you're going to find all of these details in a minute. Um, the filing fee is usually about $350, give or take, um, to start the case. So now that you have the statement of claim and you've paid your filing fee to the court, you need to serve the defendant. To serve the defendant, you have to get what's called a summons. So the clerk, the the, the court clerk, the, the person that is managing the intake of these cases is going to give you this summons. So once you file the court case and you pay the fee, then within several days, depending on the court system, you know, what county you're in, it could take anywhere from one to 10 days to get the summons. Miami-Dade County is running about seven days now, as an example. You're going to take that summons and you have two ways to serve the defendant. You can hire an independent process server. So if you just Google process server and then the county that you're in, so Martin County, um, uh, Dade County, you'll find process servers, you know, the average going rate for process servers between a hundred and $150. You could also pay the sheriff to serve your papers. So the sheriff will, in most counties, serve process. You pay them as well. So the summons and the pretrial statement are going to get handed to the process server and they're going to get served on the defendant. Service on the defendant is very important. The legal system that we have requires notice. And, and the way that you prove that the other side was notified is by either the sheriff or the process server filing what's called a return of service in the court docket. So once you pay the process server, they get the paperwork, they serve it on the defendant, the process server is going to fill out an affidavit and say, I picked up the papers at this time, I went to this address, I served the defendant, he is a white male, um, approximately the age of you know 40 with brown hair, and um, I served him with process. They will take that affidavit and they will file it with the court. And then that is proof that you have given notice to the other side. So that, that service of process is very important. Once you do that, um, you are going to get a pretrial date. Now, this is called a pretrial because it's not actually the trial. The pretrial is the, the, the point in the case when you and the other side will show up, you will go in front of the judge, the judge will then send you to mediation, which is, I'll explain in a minute, and in that process, the judge is going to try to get you and the other side to settle, to avoid the case altogether. Um, most of these are still being held via Zoom, depending on the county. Some are in person, some are in Zoom, via Zoom. Um, so the pretrial is not the trial. So you show up or it, it it's via Zoom. The judge is going to confirm that both parties are there. And if both parties are there, you and the other side, you're going to be sent to, uh, to have a mediation typically right, right then and there. And a mediator is a neutral third party that tries to get you and the other side to settle the case. So if you can settle the case, Maybe they owe you eight thousand and they've agreed to pay you six thousand and you've agreed to accept it. Maybe they owe you seven thousand and they agree to pay you a thousand dollars a month. Whatever it is, you're going to write up that agreement right on the spot. The parties are going to sign it, and now you have a settlement that if you if everyone lives up to the settlement, the case gets dismissed. If not, then you go back in front of the judge and you likely get a judgment against them immediately for any amount that they didn't pay. If you go to mediation and you don't settle, you're going to go back in front of the judge and the judge is going to ask you, okay, how much time do you need um, for this trial? How many witnesses do you have? Typically, it's at least one. 
maybe it's you and somebody else from your office. Um, and then they will set a trial date. So this is the date where you actually um, show up and present your witnesses and your documents. Effectively, this is where you tell your story um, and you argue your case so that you win. Um, now, if you show up to this pretrial and you did get good service, meaning the process server came back and said, yes, we did serve them, and the other side doesn't show up, you get what's called a default, which means you automatically win and they automatically lose. And the judge is going to give you a judgment. Typically, you'll submit it afterwards. It's not done right on the spot. But this judgment is going to be the piece of paper that says that you win and they lose and they have to pay you money. Now, there's lots of other ways, you know, we could go, we could keep talking about how to collect a judgment that's beyond the scope of this presentation. But if they don't show up and you did have good service on them, then you effectively won. And now you can garnish their bank accounts, you can show up with the sheriff and clear out their warehouse. There's lots of things you can do to try to get paid. Um, so how do you get, let's call it the finer details of, of this overview? It's very easy. So what you want to do is you want to go to Google and you're going to say, you're going to type in how to file a small claims case in, and you're going to type the county where you're going to bring this case. Um, so if you're based in Miami-Dade County, the defendant is in Miami-Dade County, the project is in Miami-Dade County, you're going to say how to file a small claims case in Miami-Dade County. And typically, the first and or second result is going to be a web page on the clerk's website dedicated exclusively to small claims cases. It's going to have all of the same information that I told you, but it's also going to have all of the forms. It's going to have the phone number for the clerk. It's going to have the phone number for the sheriff so that you can serve process. Um, it goes into much greater detail into how to file the case with all of the paperwork that you need. The hardest one to file is the first one, but after that, it's pretty easy. Um, it's just mostly paperwork. And I will tell you, the vast majority of the cases that you decide to bring will likely settle before you even get to the pretrial, or if they don't settle then, they will likely settle at mediation. Very, very few of the cases that you bring will likely ever go to trial. Um, so we encourage all of our clients, rather than sending us a case for $8,000 or less, that they go through this process and they do it themselves. It's a great way to save some money. Um, it's not that complicated. It's a little intimidating, but once you get past the um, initial shock of doing it the first time, it's uh it's pretty straightforward. So Ariella, do we have any questions? Let's have a look. And so far, we do not have any questions. So our email addresses are here. So if you have any questions about any of the things we talked about, feel free to um, send us an email. We're happy to answer your questions. Um, one of the things that you can do to help you uh, learn a little bit more about the lean process is if you go to leanomatic.com, you can down, you can order for free a desk tool that we offer um, that explains the lean and bond process uh, in the state of Florida. It tells you what to file and when to file it. Um, and uh, if you also go to the Sunray website, they have a great amount of uh, tools and resources there to help you learn what to file and when. Um, we do these webinars all the time, uh, once a month. Our next webinar is in November. Uh, there's a typo there. It's actually November 3rd, not 83rd. Um, three scary contract provisions to keep out of your contract and three to add. We'll go into some detail about contract provisions. And then several times a year, uh, especially now that um, COVID has subsided, we do live presentations for three hours. We go a very deep dive into the lien law, contract provisions, and collections. Our next one is on September 27th in Boca Raton from 8 to 11. You can sign up for 
the seminar at sunraynotice.com forward slash seminars. And you can sign up for all of the webinars at sunraynotice.com forward slash webinars. Well, Alex, so, thank you so much. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> any questions? Still no questions? No, I, you did such an incredible job that people, you know, have their answers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have a sunny day.